everybody. Uh, this is Brother Luke, uh, Sin City Preacher, and welcome to another episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. And the subject tonight is Old Testament pictures and shadows of Jesus' blood atonement. And I'm really, really excited about this subject, but first let me introduce the panelists. Uh, we have Brother Ronnie, and, and he his YouTube channel is known as Hood Minister, and I'm going to ask Brother Ronnie to talk just for a minute. Just tell him a little bit about your channel, and I hope everybody will subscribe to his channel. Go ahead, Ronnie. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Okay, great. Uh, my, I, I'm really a nothing or nobody. I only have like one video, and it tells about the Father's love and Lord Jesus Christ and, and uh, the invitation to come to him. Uh, that's about it on my channel. It's nothing important, but I, I love uh, sharing the gospel. Can you hear me, brother? Yeah, I heard that. I, I heard that. Thank you. Uh, let me uh, boast about you, Ronnie, because you're a humble man and you don't want to boast uh, yourself. Uh, but, uh, I've known Brother Ronnie now. Can you mute your, uh, mute your hand, Ronnie, because I'm getting the feedback. Just mute your, your microphone. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, I've known Brother Ronnie here for probably over the last six months or a year. I noticed he started commenting on a lot of my videos, and his comments have been uh, not only just absolutely encouraging to me, but the message that he has uh, put in all those comments is pure, pure, free grace, free gift salvation message. And it's just wonderful every time I meet another believer that believes that salvation's free. I just get so excited, and Ronnie's been a great encouragement to me, and I think his gift, his calling, is to encourage other believers, and also uh, he has a real gift for the written word. He, when he starts writing about something, it, it's just the way he expresses it is just, Ronnie, I've actually started weeping a few times from some of your, your emails, so I really appreciate that. Now we're going to move on to Brother Salam. You all know him. He's a, a young Baptist, 07. He's been on several of these shows already. So, uh, Brother Salam, say hi to everybody. Hi. <laughs> okay, we're, we're going to start the show. Everybody, please sub subscribe to Hood Minister and Young Baptist 07. Thank you. Now, we're going to move on into this subject, and this subject, I expect, could take several episodes to complete. Uh, there's a lot to it, and it's very, very exciting. Uh, I'm going to, we're going to be covering a lot of scriptures and a lot of uh, uh, people and things in the Bible, but uh, I'm going to also refer to some of the things that I've learned in my research this week that people have written on this subject. So I will be quoting uh, what other people have said uh, I may not know their name, but I'll, I'll, I'm not going to take credit for their words. Here, here's, let me start off with this, because this kind of puts it in the nutshell. Quote, the Old Testament is the New Testament concealed. The New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. Okay? So I'm going to ask you guys to expound on that just for maybe a, a 30 seconds or a minute. Just that basic concept that the Old Testament is the New Testament concealed, and the New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. Uh, Ronnie, you want to go first? If you do, turn your mic, your microphone on. Can you hear me, guys? Yeah. Yes. I guess. Go ahead. Yeah, I'm sorry I'm such a computer moron, but I am. Uh, yeah, it, it, that's very true. Now, <clears throat> a lot of people preach uh, the gospel, which is found Paul's gospel in uh, 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 15, verses 1 through 4. Which tells about the uh, crucifixion, the death, the burial, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, and uh, all those who witnessed him uh, during the time he was here. I think there's over 500 witnesses. Uh, okay, but we, if we look back in the Old Testament, you know we can see the Word of God starting first of all in Genesis 1:1. Uh, but as we go on, after after sin came, when when Satan uh, uh, tricked a woman and she ate the fruit. God gave his first uh, 
uh, promise or foretelling of, I believe, of the Lord Jesus Christ, his coming, the, the son of God, to defeat the, the son of the devil, uh, the seed of the woman. And then we see uh, where God had, uh, had to slay an animal for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And uh, so we see that. We, God gave them a covering where the devil tried giving them leaves to cover themselves in. There is no covering for sin throughout the Old Testament without the shedding of blood. Uh, then we can go on to uh, the lamb. Uh, my, perfect, my favorite part is the Passover lamb where you can see very clearly the cross of Jesus Christ, his crucifixion. Uh, the lamb of God, who I, I think it's in Leviticus uh, 16 verses 1 uh, through 7, where it talks about God commanded the Israelites to take a, a baby lamb of the first year, uh, innocent, beautiful little lamb, and take it into their homes and uh, keep it for four days, from the uh, tenth day of the first month of the Jewish calendar till the fourteenth day. So they got to look at this innocent little lamb and uh, how gentle and how humble that little lamb was. You know, if you put it in that kind of language. Um, and then at the end of those four, four days, they'd have to take it and slay it. And I believe that was done in uh, front of their doors. And then they'd take that blood and they'd splash it on the upper door posts and on the two sides. Well, not splash it, but they hit both sides. Strike it, strike it with high set. And that's the difference. They struck it. And then the blood would fall from the bottom, or from the top to the bottom. And you can see from the two sides, it forms a cross right there. That's one part, uh, and then we can look forward to uh, we can look at the brazen serpent, and uh, so we can look through the uh, temple sacrifices also, or, or the uh, tabernacle sacrifices to begin with, where lambs and bullocks were were, t were taken and they were slain uh, for the sins of the people and the sins of the priests. We could take a look at in the wilderness camp. Oh, praise God! Uh, where the, all the Israelites, all the tribes, when they came together around the tabernacle, the numbers of them, you know, by uh, by tribe, uh, if you if you take the numbers and you put them where they belong on both sides, and then it was from the north to south, the east to the west, that also uh, shapes across, mm -hmm. as did the tabernacle itself. We can look at uh, uh, the altar, the uh, or not the altar, the uh, uh, what was that? The two angels over the um, what would it put in the Yeah. The what? The Ark of the Covenant. And you take the if you look at the Ark of the Covenant, you can see, even at looking at the 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 tomb where Jesus was raised from the dead, there's two angels there and, and it had to have a blood atonement. And Jesus, the appropriation for our sins, you know, he used the covering. He he used the covering of that and he covered the law. God's mercy is greater and above the law. Brother, uh, you're, you're giving us what I would call a uh, cliff notes or a reader's digest of the whole uh, study. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> you got to mute. Mute your thing there for a second. You got it muted? Okay, that's good. Uh, yeah, all those things that you have mentioned, are uh, that, that's a few of the many things that we'll be discussing in all these episodes, and you're kind of, you're, you could go on and on. There is so much to it. Uh, but the idea that, that you've made there clearly is that in the Old Testament, we see everything that we've learned in the New Testament about the death of Jesus for our sins, it's all through the Old Testament. And uh, it's, it not only is um, thrilling to see it, to, but it also should confirm our belief in the Bible. We should have more confidence in the Scriptures because of, of the fact that uh, these are all pictures of the future uh, death on the cross for our sins. Salam, so um, now the saying I quoted there, uh, just, the Old Testament is the New Testament concealed, and the New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. Just that saying, it's, I've heard it many times over the years, but how, what's your response to that point there? Um, I I agree um, with that with that statement. Um, I I too have a I too have a, a way of viewing the Old and New Testament. Now, um, if you've ever seen those um, old school 
film strips, when you used to take films and you used to have the little strips and you kind of look at it in the light and you can make out what the picture is, you know, it's kind of, I don't know what it is because I never really had one, but it's like these films, uh, when you take a picture and you get the, the, the films that spin and you look at it in the mirror and you can see what the picture is, the outline of it, that's what the Old Testament is. It's looking at it and you can kind of see what the picture is. You can kind of see um, what's in the picture. And the New Testament is like a digital camera. When you take a picture, you see it clearly. You see um, you see uh, the image clearly. You see the lighting, the people's faces, the emotions. That's why I see the Old and New Testament is. And, um, yeah, I agree with, with that statement. And... Mm -hmm. Well, I, I think the, uh, um, I, I don't want to go off onto another different subject entirely, but uh, there's a lot of people uh, arguing about dispensations. And some people, I think, go too far, uh, what's called into hyper-dispensationalism. But as, as Donnie mentioned, the uh, idea that uh, Jesus would die for our sins, he'd be buried and raised from the dead, um, this is what he did for us so that we can receive this free gift of eternal life. But this is not limited to 1 Corinthians. It's not limited to any of the other books in the New Testament. It's all through the Old Testament. And it's exciting to see this blood sacrifice of Jesus Christ pictured all through the Old Testament. So the idea that uh, 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 we're going to have a Savior provided for us. Let me read this. This is uh, very short, but I just, someone, I'm going to quote, I don't know who wrote it, but they said, quote, it is almost as if the characters in the Old Testament are acting out of play, the meaning of which they are completely unaware. It is only the audience of the play, those who watch in light of solid knowledge of the New Testament, who understand the meaning of the words and events in the play. That really puts it, uh, it, explains it perfectly to me. We are looking back. We, have, uh, we look back uh, to what Jesus did. The people uh, before the cross, they were looking forward to this, what he would do. And to me, this is the real dividing point as far as uh, dispensations. Uh, in the Old Testament, they were looking forward to a, a Savior that would come to uh, provide salvation. We look back and say, it's done. He did it. Um, but isn't it interesting that because we have all the information, we have the New Testament, we've, by studying it, when we look back at the Old Testament, it's like we can understand this play, but the actors performing in the play in the Old Testament, they, uh, they played the parts and uh, acted it out and did all the rituals and ceremonies and sacrifices but did they really understand the full meaning of it the way we do when we look back at it? So, uh, who wants to uh, elaborate on that point? Just go like that. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I agree. And I mean, that's, that's like another illustration out of uh, many uh, we can use when comparing the Old and New Testament. I know for one personally, when... Um, when you grasp the, uh, the New Testament and uh, the message it, it portrays and what Christ did, you go back to the Old Testament, kind of, you know, having having foreknowledge and like if you were there at the time, you would understand much more than what the Israelites did, or you'd understand why they did what they did, you know, and it would be almost like, you know, yeah. You're you're watching a play, but but you know you know the beginning from then. You know why they're doing this, even if they didn't at the time. So yeah, Ronnie, you want to comment on that? Sit on muted. Yeah. Uh, okay. Hey, I'm playing with that. You know, have patience with me, please. Yeah, it's uh, it's beautiful. I I see the Old Testament because we have the Holy. Spirit. The Spirit teaches us the Word, and the Word of God is the living Word. Can you hear me now? Yeah, I hear. Okay. 
But as we're back in the Old Testament, you can see, I was trying to explain this to another brother yesterday in my comments, but I don't think he got it. He said it was nonsense. But you can, you can look to 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, and you can see like little pictures in a grand mosaic of God, you know, starting in the Old Testament, you know, the types, typologies, foreshadows of Jesus Christ, his, his, uh, his blood atoning death, uh, his uh, terrible suffering on the cross, the piercing of his hands and his feet for us, uh, his, his burial and his resurrection, shown in, shown in so many areas in the Old Testament. You can't take just uh, 1 Corinthians 15, uh, 1 through 4, and say that's the gospel and that's the only thing you need to believe. But as Christians, we can look back and see it all through the Old Testament and God's grace from Genesis 1, 1, all the way through, even through the times of the law. Yeah, amen. Amen. The, uh, uh, all the things that you mentioned, um, you got to mute your center, you go. All the things that you've mentioned, uh, I have 11 pages of typewritten notes. <laughs> so uh, I have hundreds of scriptures and, and events and things that we're going to be going through. It'll probably take us several episodes. But all the things that you've mentioned are on the list. So we're going to really go into depth on all those those subjects. But let's start off with this. Uh, let's res respond to this verse here. John 5, 45, 46, 47. Uh, Do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. There is one that accuses you, even Moses, in whom ye trust. For ye had believed Moses... For, for had ye believed Moses, ye would have believed me, for he wrote of me. But if ye believe not his writing, how shall ye believe my words? We'll start with uh, Salam. Salam, uh, we know this is Jesus talking to the Pharisees. Uh, and uh, what's the point he's making there? Um, he's, he's tying himself uh, to, the, to the Old Testament. Um, simply put, you know, when when Christ came, um, he made it clear on the sermon, you know, on the sermon on the mount that he did not come to destroy the law, but he came to fulfill the law. So by him saying this directly in John chapter five, it directly ties him to the Old Testament. It directly means that he is that Messiah. He is the one that has been prophesied about. He is the Savior. I mean, he this this kind of um, gives him the, the credibility, not that he needs it, but to the to the to the listening ears of the um, of the Pharisees, this this shows them that no, I have authority and this is the reason why I have the power. Why? Because Moses, he will of me and then you call Moses your greatest prophet. Yeah, if you had believed him, you would believe me. So. Yes. Okay, uh, I want to ask Ron, uh, when he refers to Moses wrote about him, what did, what did Moses write, and what's he referring to? Well, we can look at uh, all the way back to Mount Sinai. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Yep. Okay. Uh, look back to Mount Sinai, and, and the, well, let's go back even farther. I came out of e from Egypt to Sinai. You can see all of God's grace through that time period. You know, they're still almost like under the, the same covenant uh, Abraham, uh, where Abraham believed God and his covenant on him to righteousness. You know, he, was, he was described as a man of faith. You know, God didn't kill anybody during that time period, didn't punish anyone during that time period. But when they got to Mount Sinai and they saw the terror of the Lord, the greatness and goodness of God, his holiness and wonder, and his absolute power uh, as he was uh, on top of that mountain, uh, Mount Sinai. Uh, we, we looked at it, the people there said, uh, Moses, Moses, because they're terrified, you go up and speak for us. And, uh, and he said, uh, because we, need some, we need somebody to speak for us who speaks the words of God, but yet are like us. And, and God said, the Father said to Moses, that's good that they said that. Because that's exactly who you know I'm going to send. That that was kind of a prophecy that God would send one who was like him, but yet other people and could speak to the people. Uh, would, would not be a heaven. 
could you could you tell me specifically uh, when Jesus says that um, Moses wrote of me? What, do you know what Jesus, what Moses wrote? Uh, well, he wrote the Ten Commandments as a figure, you know, figure of. Uh, uh, Moses didn't write that. He wrote the first first five books of the Bible. That's the point. Uh, That's the yeah, point. Okay, yeah. sorry. Uh, I so, get off on tangents sometimes. I'll hear I'll, something and I'll start preaching about it or something. Okay, I want to ask uh, Salam, and, and you're getting better at reading, but try to remember uh, when, when someone else is talking to mute your mic. Otherwise, we all that horrible feedback. Brother Salam. Yes. Um, when G Jesus said um, that Moses wrote of him, what what do you think he was referring to when Jesus said Moses wrote about Jesus? Well, um, it talks about I believe it talks about um, you know diff different prophecies and, and types and shadows in the first five books because whilst of course. Moses wrote the, the five books. Not every single event is about Jesus. You know, it's about history. It's about the history of the Jews. But throughout those events, from the moment, um, you know, from from Genesis to the Book of Deuteronomy, there are many different things Moses wrote in there, which are pointing directly to Christ, and only Christ could fulfill. And so, when he said Moses wrote of me, that's exactly what I was talking about. The pictures the types, the images, the shadows, everything, all those kind of things, the the prophecies uh, that one day someone will come, you know, from the tribe of Judah and so on and so forth. That's all referring to Christ. So. What, what, I, what I get out of this is two important things. Um, one is that he wants them to know that um, Moses told about his him coming and, and that this he would, uh, there was a Messiah, a Savior coming. And if you read the writings of Moses, the first five books, we have the Old Testament called the Law and the Prophets. Wrote, I think Moses attributed to his writing the Law, the first five books. And then uh, the, um, uh, the fact that if you place such greatness on Moses, well, just how great am I? Moses was writing about me. Moses was telling me about me. So you value Moses, but you're missing the whole point. He was trying to tell you about me. Yes. Okay? So, now I'm going to move on now to this uh, Luke 24, 25. And it says, Then he said unto them, O fools and slow of heart, to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So this is Jesus, and he's, uh, I believe this is Jesus after the resurrection when he appeared to the people on the road to Emmaus. And he went through all the scriptures telling the people these were the scriptures that were talking about the fact that I would come and what I would do. Uh, so we have two examples here so far of Jesus referring to Moses wrote about him and then here he is after the resurrection saying, these are the things in, this, in the scriptures that were written beforehand about me. Okay, I'm going to cover another verse in a minute, but before we move on, uh, do you guys want to make a comment on uh, that point there? All the scriptures, uh, the things concerning himself. Um, oh, oh, okay. Sorry? Go ahead, Salam, you go first, and then we'll have Ronnie. No, um, you know, I think I think what Jesus says there is is correct, and I mean in verse twenty-seven, the the author makes it clear from beginning at Moses and all the prophets. So you know that includes um, not not just the the first five books, but it's talking about the the prophetical books as well. And I know in another passage it talks about the Psalms as well. So it covers the entire Old Testament and how 
you know, the Old Testament is just a picture of Christ. I think uh, what what what's said in verse twenty-seven is correct. And um, mm -hmm. yes, so he says uh, throughout all the scriptures, uh, there are things written concerning him. Uh, and Ronnie, did you want to say something about that that verse, that point? Am I on? Yeah. You guys hear me? Okay. Yeah, again, I have to go back and say that the Lord is saying here, you know, he didn't leave us any photographs of himself, but what he says, you can learn all about me throughout the whole scripture from the beginning onward. The pictures, types, typologies, and shadows written from Moses, the first five books in there, uh, Leviticus, and, and uh, throughout the sacrifices, which I'm sure you'll get into, um, in the Psalms, like you said, and the other prophets. I'd like to say, here some, read something here, too. It just came to me out of uh, Luke uh, 17, no, 10, um, 24. For I tell you that many prophets and kings have desired to see the things which you see and, and have not seen them, and to hear the things which you hear and have not heard them. So uh, the, uh, all the Old Testament prophets, kings, and, and uh, Israelites, they, they would, and, and those who uh, were inspired by the Holy Spirit to write these scriptures about Jesus, the one to come, the Messiah, you know, they wondered about those things, and it was hidden from them, you know. Uh, but uh, like you said, it was revealed throughout the New Testament. So, okay. But I'd like to say one more thing, that uh, in John uh, 1, 7, it says, uh, the law came by Moses, but the grace and truth came by uh, Jesus Christ. Uh, the person of God, the great I am, had come and uh, proving, you know, he used the grace and, and mercy of God to come to us and die for our sins. Amen. Uh, so the, the, the point I really want to emphasize here is that these verses are confirming the premise that I laid in the very beginning, and that is the Old Testament is the New Testament concealed. So here we have two examples of Jesus telling the Pharisees, and then after the resurrection, telling him on the road to Emmaus that uh, it, it's all it's all been been written already in the in the scriptures. They've been writing about me all this time, uh, but it's been kind of concealed and hidden. And now the truth has come out; that it, that it's fulfilled. Let's let's move on now to Acts 17:1, and it says uh, one through three. It says. Now, when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, uh, where was a synagogue of the Jews. And Paul, as his manner was, went in unto them, and three Sabbath days reasoned with them out of the scriptures, opening and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead, and that this Jesus, whom I preach unto you, is Christ. So now we have another example, not Jesus, but this is the Apostle Paul. Uh, you know, he's uh, referred to as the Apostle to the Gentiles, and yet he, he continued uh, going to synagogues. Every, it says, as was his custom. Uh, uh, he always went, every town he went to, he always found a synagogue. He never gave up on the Jews. He'd always go to the Jews and preach to them. And the way he preached to them was going through the scriptures, talking about all the things we're going to be discussing in this study, and revealing to them that, uh, that, that Christ must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead. So he's saying... Look, I'm showing you from the Old Testament scriptures. There was no New Testament written at that point yet. So the only scriptures that, that you, we could, uh, he could have referred to was what we call the Old Testament. So in the Law and the Prophets, Paul went through them, just as Jesus did on the road to Emmaus, and said, this was about Jesus, this was about Jesus, this was about Jesus, this was about Jesus. He would die for our sins. He would be raised from the dead, and so on and so on. So... Um, We'll start with Salam. What do you want to say about about that? No, I agree. Of course, of course, the New Testament canon was not complete at this time. So the only scriptures uh, that Paul could have been talking from 
um, of course, is the Old Testament. And, you know, yeah, you make a point in saying that Paul, even though he is an apostle to the Gentiles, um, his custom was always to go to the Jews, you know. He's always had a burden for the Jews. And, of course, he addresses this in other, um, in other letters uh, he writes. For example, in Romans chapter, in Romans chapter 9 and in Romans chapter 10, um, his love for the Jews. But, yeah, I mean, just like how Christ expounded um, about himself, which sounds funny anyway, to his disciples, here we have the Apostle Paul expounding to uh, these Jews about who Christ is alleging. It says it alleging that Christ must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead and that this Jesus whom I preach unto is Christ. So it's not just talking about, okay, well, this is a picture of Christ. No, he's he's alleging that he he had, he must die and is risen again from the dead. So he's preaching the gospel the death, the burial, and resurrection from the Old Testament. So this is merely not just, okay, well, um, okay, a ram was caught in, a, in the thicket, and that's a picture of Christ. No, this is, no, Christ, he needed to die, and he needed to rise again from the dead. So, I mean, this, this is concrete proof. This is like dynamite. This is gold dust when it comes to showing how the Old Testament um, has a lot of weight, and Christ, when he came to fulfill the Old Testament, um, he was fulfilling what was really spoken of him, and he is the Christ. He was not an impostor, so. Okay, a very good point. So, Jesus, more than once, and Paul, uh, on a regular basis, would go through the scriptures and, and use the scriptures to prove that Jesus is the Christ. Uh, Ronnie, do you want to uh, comment on Acts 17, 1 through 3? I don't know I could do better than uh, Brother Salam there. He just spoke wonderfully. Um, the only thing I would say is many people are stuck on that the Apostle Paul uh, <clears throat> only was an uh, apostle to the, to the Gentiles. But he also, like you said, uh, expounded uh, the scriptures to the Jews concerning the Christ and that Jesus was one who fulfilled the law. I think they had a lot of difficulty with that, the Jewish people. Yes. Uh, they, uh, <clears throat> you know, the, the Jews look for, for signs, and, and the Gentiles look for knowledge. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I, I don't want to add to that. I think, uh, unless you look at uh, Stephen's dissertation, I think that's a great exegesis sir, of uh, uh, looking at the uh, Jesus Christ in the Old Testament then how the religiosity of the, of the Jews, even back then, they really didn't follow Moses, like uh, on Mount Sinai, uh, they, they dis uh, disobeyed him because he wasn't around for 40 days. Well, same thing in the New Testament, they really uh, couldn't accept Jesus Christ as God in the flesh, the great I Am and the Savior. But I love what the Brother Salam said, he said so much better than I could ever could. Yeah, I, I, will, uh, I want to uh, respond to b both of your comments in, when you answered my uh, kind of title for Paul, uh, Apostle to the Gentiles. I think that uh, there's a big misunderstanding. I've stated this in many of my other videos that, uh, yeah, Paul was, was called the Apostle to the Gentiles, but he all continued preaching to Jews. And yet, you look at every other Apostle, the only one that I believe may not have gone to preach to Gentiles is James. I believe he stayed in Jerusalem and ran the Jerusalem church all, the entire time. So, but outside of James, all the other apostles, they left Jerusalem and they went off all to different countries and they were preaching to Gentiles. So we call Paul the apostle to the Gentiles, but the good news of our salvation through our faith in our Savior, that, was, that message was preached by all the apostles to the whole world. Uh, Paul was not the only one to preach to the Gentiles. Now let's, I'm going to, let me uh, kind of sum up what we've done so far. I think we've laid a foundation that, uh, for this, uh, the fact that the, uh, the Old Testament is talking all about the, the Savior to come. And the New Testament is talking that this Savior that was prophesied in the Old Testament and pictured uh, in the festivals and ceremonies and uh, in so many different ways, this, that uh, Savior has come, and it is Jesus Christ. 
So in the Old Testament, the, the, uh, the message was we look forward to this coming Savior, and then the message in the New Testament is we look backward and say, He came, he's, he, our Savior came, and it is Jesus Christ, and He is my Savior. Uh, now I'm going to uh, attempt to start with the earliest references uh, in, in Genesis, and we're going to work our way. I hope I've tried to arrange 11 pages of notes here into chronological order. I may have made some mistakes along the way, so if you if you can cite something that that illustrates this, uh, let me unplug this phone here. I usually unplug my phone before I start any video, so I apologize. Um, the okay, so we proved the point that the Old Testament is the New Testament concealed. I mean, we laid this foundation. Now we want to go chronologically, and as I go, if I skip one that you have uh, comes to your mind, then bring it up at the appropriate time. Uh, because I'm trying to, I want to do them progressively in chronological order, okay? Uh, yes. So I'm going, to, I'm going to start with Genesis 2.9. Uh, as the first, to me, it's the first reference that I can see that I think we can find a type or um, symbol uh, of Jesus Christ. Genesis 2.9 says, And out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life, also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Um, I think I first heard this, uh, what I'm going to say, from Brother Mitchell Belenkoff, who uh, is trying to get on the show, but he has computer problems. But uh, I, I heard him teach on this, and it made a lot of sense to me. Uh, the tree of life, uh, let me go unplug my phone for a second. I'll be right back. Hey brothers, uh, I apologize. Uh, it's the first time in, in several hundred videos I've ever neglected to unplug my telephone from the wall. <laughs> okay. Uh, the tree of life. First of all, uh, the tree of life, I believe, is, a, is uh, we say that if you eat from the tree of life, they would have life, eternal life. Uh, we're going to get to a point later where they're told, kept out of the garden, unless they eat from this tree of life and have eternal life. So the tree of life, the way we get eternal life is, is through Jesus Christ. He is the giver of eternal life. And the tree is what he was hung on. Um, it, it says in Galatians 3.13, Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. So I, I see the tree of life, this reference to the tree of life in the Garden of Eden, as a picture of Jesus Christ, who was the giver of eternal life, hanging on a tree so that we could be redeemed. And now I look at, I look at the tree of knowledge of good and evil, I look at that as the law. Because... Paul says that uh, until the law came, there was no uh, uh, knowledge or there was no, what's it, how did he phrase it? Uh, I think I've got it written here somewhere. But he refers to until we had the law, there was no, the sin was not imputed. So I, I look at the, the tree of good and no, uh, knowledge of good and evil as once they ate from that, then they're under the law. of the I, They didn't have the written law at that time, but they had the law of the conscience. So they had a conscience, now they knew right and wrong, so now they're going to be held responsible. So do you see this uh, idea that uh, the tree of life could be representative of Jesus Christ, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil could be representative of uh, the law which convicts us? Uh, yeah. Yeah, I see. I see a, a logical explanation of that. 
Um, it's one. It's one I'd never given thought before. So um, you know, it's it's interesting the way you've explained it. But yeah, yeah, I can see that definitely, brother. Okay, we're going to go get discuss it a little further in a moment. But I want to get your initial reaction to that. When I first heard it from uh, Brother Mitchell, uh, I was kind of blown away by the idea. But the more I thought about it, it, it really I can see it. Uh, Brother Ronnie, do you have anything to say about that concept? It sounds a little new to me, but I think it's it's a beautiful concept. Um, uh, but also, I see choice you know, there. We, we, I do agree with you with a with a law representing the true knowledge of good and evil, because if they had not sinned and eaten of that, they wouldn't have understood what was like right and wrong and have a conscious choice. So God, in His love, even from the beginning, gave us a choice. And the tree of life, as you say, represents Jesus Christ. And if we look to him and come to him and eat of him and his fruit, like the bread of life or, uh, you know, drink, or the, he's the vine, we are the branches, I, I see the cross there also. But we are given a choice, and it's God's love. He never made us a robot. He, did, he doesn't make us robots now. Uh, we can refuse Christ even today, the, the tree of life. Or we can come to him and be saved and, and come to not only just life, but eternal life. Thanks, brother. Amen. We, uh, I, I don't think any of us are Calvinists, so we know that we do have free, free will. We have the ability to choose Jesus or reject him. And uh, thankfully, thankfully uh, we have all uh, chosen uh, to put our faith in Jesus. Now, Brother Salon says, Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. So it says that Christ was made a curse for us as he hung on that tree, that cross. Mm -hmm. Salam? Uh, what would, would you like to just uh, me to add anything to that? Yeah, I just want to get your reaction if you have to add anything or a reaction before I move on. Well, yeah, I mean, um, Christ, you know, um, the, the curse, what, what, is, what is the curse of the law? The curse of the law, you know, it's that if, if you're going to do one part of the law, then you have to do it all. Therefore, it's a curse. It's an unbroken chain. If you say you want to keep circumcision, then you have to keep the other section of the law as well, all of it. And so it's a curse. And so the fact that Christ became a curse for us, um, curses everyone that, that hangs in a tree, which actually comes from an int interesting passage in the book of Deuteronomy, where it where it does talk about curses everyone who does not keep the whole law. It mentions that, and that's where that um, quotation is taken from a passage in the book of Deuteronomy. And so Christ taking all the law shows that Christ came to fulfill all of it, not just part. It didn't come to destroy it, fulfill all of it. Therefore, we don't have to be under that curse. Instead, we can get the blessing from him fulfilling it by faith. So. Amen. The, uh, the idea is that if a person chooses to uh, attempt to be uh, reconciled with God through their personal merit, if they say, I'm going to be a good person, and then the, the, the burden on them is that they've not only got to be a good person, they've got to be perfect because the law yeah. requires perfection. And then this is a curse because it's impossible. It's Indeed. Impossible. It's impossible. That, that's what we all need to come to the understanding of, that it is impossible. And once we understand that and we realize that we are in a helpless, hopeless condition, then we call on the name of the Lord Jesus and say, I need you to save me. Because yep. I'm in a hopeless situation. I'm cursed because it's impossible for me to have perfection and be uh, satisfactory to God. So, Ronnie, before I move on, do you want to say something about that? Okay, I'm going to go to Romans 5.18. Therefore, is it even by, therefore, as by the offense of one, what's that sound? Is that the, okay, uh, uh, 
Ronnie, you've got to mute him. Yeah, don't forget to mute. Yeah. Um, there, Romans 5.18. Therefore, as by the offense of one, and that's referring to Adam, judgment came upon all men to condemnation. Even so, by the righteousness of one, Jesus, the free gift, came upon all men unto justification of life. So, I'm, I'm citing this verse as a reference when we're going to compare Adam and Jesus Christ. So, and I, let me say, we're going to be talking not only about events that have happened, and also things like rituals and ceremonies and things, but also some individuals that are kind of pictures uh, of Christ or types of Christ. And um, uh, Jesus is referred to in the Bible as the second Adam. So here it says, therefore, as by the offense of one, that's Adam, judgment came upon all men. Uh, the righteousness of one, that's Jesus, the free gift came upon all men, that's justification. So instead of a type, it seemed like a like an anti-type here. Uh, Adam brought the curse, and Jesus brought the free gift. Okay? Yep. All right, now let's... let's Get, go to Genesis 3.21. Unto Adam also, and to his wife, did the Lord God make coats of skin and clothe them. And the Lord God said, Behold, the man is become as one of us, good and evil. And now, lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat, and live forever. Um, we talked about the tree of life, uh, but what about the coats of skin? Ronnie, you mentioned this in your first comment. Uh, do you want to elaborate what this is referring to? When Jesus, you said that God made made coats of skins and clothed Adam and Eve in them. What's the significance of that? Am I muted? Yeah, you're fine. Okay. Well, there again, you see, for the first time, I, I believe the uh, wages of sin is death, or without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. And we see where the Lord God made coats of skin to cover them, their nakedness or their sinfulness, um, which is a blood covering. Again, looking forward to the coming of the, of the Savior. Um, <clears throat> Whereas the devil, and if you look at world religions today, there's, there's always some kind of other thing they have to do. And the devil offered, or, or they cover themselves with, or even man-made teachings, uh, doctrines, they cover themselves with, with fig leaves, and that, wasn't, uh, that would not be a proper covering uh, for, for the sin. Well, okay, that's a good point. Salam, can you see a difference between a fig leaf and an animal skin? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's there's a clear difference. I don't know if you if you've ever tried to make an apron out of fig leaves, but it's it's ridiculous. And I mean, to to think you can cover the human body uh, with a bunch of leaves just shows the the futility uh, to think that you can somehow earn your salvation by your good works. It's just as stupid as someone you know with wrapped in fig leaves. And of course, coats, coats of skin gives an entirely different picture. I mean, if you put on a coat, a coat completely covers you. There's no space in between. It's not. It's it's one seam. It's together. And so, coats of skin shows the complete covering. You know, of of um the, the complete covering of Christ over the sin of men, justifying him, not just in part, but whole, completely, no gaps, one seam. So, yes, there's a marked difference there. I want to add a couple of other points to that, even though everything you said is certainly valid, very good points. Uh, but one is uh, Adam and Eve 
were attempting to uh, remedy the situation on, based on their own effort. They were trying to cover themselves up, uh, and that is that is uh, comparable to personal works. They were trying to solve the problem by covering themselves up. Uh, but we know that uh, we can't solve the problem no matter what we do. God yep. has to solve the problem for us. So God provided a coat, a covering for them, because their their effort was was uh, insufficient. Only God can really solve the problem. Now the coat being a complete covering is is a very interesting point. But the, to me, I see the main difference between the leaves and the skin is that the leaf, the skin blood was shed, and this. Blood being shed, this is the very first case where we see blood was shed in the Bible. And throughout this whole study, we're going to see over and over and over again, blood was shed. No, there's no remission of sins without the shedding of blood. So um, yeah, I think that the leaves and the skin are the two most important points in my mind. Are One, uh, the, the leaves represented Adam and Eve's own efforts. Uh, and, and there was no shedding of blood. Uh, the coat represented God providing the covering, and just as God provides our covering through Jesus Christ, we're covered with his blood, and also he gives us covering, uh, uh, I think in Revelations it refers to that we're going to all be covered with white robes, uh, robes of righteousness. So, uh, But that only happened because of shedding of blood, because Jesus' blood was shed, we can receive this covering from his blood and this white robe of righteousness. All right, uh, let's look at um, uh, something else that, uh, that you referred to in your opening, uh, Ronnie, is Genesis 3.15, and it says, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Uh, okay, uh, Ronnie, you, you mentioned it earlier, so let me give you first chance to elaborate on this. W what is this telling us? Well, here again we see the coming of Jesus Christ, the seed of the woman. Uh, not the seed of the man, but the seed of the woman, the perfect one, the, the Son of God, Emmanuel, God with us. Uh, against Satan, uh, who would come, and, and uh, Jesus Christ here it says the enemy, because of his doings, uh, would bruise his heel, and never see the cross, in the shedding of his blood. Uh, but even so, at the cross, he also crushed Satan's head. So that's what I see there, and uh, only through him are we going to have any victory over sin, death, or the devil, and uh, gain eternal life. Um, through the shedding of his precious blood. But I think this is a, one of the great foretellings of the coming of the, of the Messiah. Yeah. All right. That, that's, that's the first indication, the first foretelling uh, or prophecy of the, the Messiah, the, the Savior, dying for our sins. Uh, this is the first one. We have these other things, the coats of skin and, and, and also the idea of the tree of life and so on. But this one is the actual prophecy that we can refer to as the prophecy of the, uh, Jesus uh, defeating Satan and, and uh, giving us the victory. Uh, Salam, let me see. I want to ask you here. I will put enmity between thee and the woman. Okay, who is thee and who is the woman? Uh, thee, of course, is referring to Satan. And uh, between thee and the woman... Um, of course, talking about um, you know Christ being born, and I mean the the the, the woman, um, the physical mother, of course, of Christ is Mary, and of course this 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 is more than than just um, a picture for Genesis, as in it's not just okay. I'm gonna put enmity between thee and the woman, as in okay between you and Mary, but I'm gonna put enmity between you and the woman seed and it's interesting because many times through, through the Bible um, women in one way or another 
have um, taken victory over Satan, whether directly or through indirectly giving birth to somebody who would foil the plans of Satan in one time period or another, whether it's in the times of the kings or the judges or Esther or so on. I mean, we can see many times how the woman follows the plans of Satan throughout the, the scripture. And so, I mean, it says that 3.15 is very clear. I will put enmity between thee and the woman. I will make an alienation between you. You deceived the woman to to um, to sin, you know, and so I'm going to put enmity between you. I mean, it's going to be different now. I mean, there's, there's no more going to be this communication between you and Eve as it happened um, in the previous... Um, at the start of the, of the chapter, it's going to be different from now on. And of course, you know, um, in verse 16, it, it goes and passes judgment over onto the woman as well, and what's going to be the consequences of her action, and of course, the men, so Adam and Eve. So, hey, can you, uh, when it says between thy seed and her seed, uh, thy seed, that's referring to Satan. And, and her seed is referring eventually to, to Mary. <coughs> but first of all, what is there a seed of Satan? And, and also, how could a woman, Mary, have a seed? Because women have eggs, men have seeds. So, when yep. the men provides the seed, the woman has the egg. So uh, how could you say her seed, and what is thy seed, meaning referring to the devil's seed? Um, between... I'll put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed. Now, of course, um, seed, uh, many times when it talks about conception, you know, it says the, the woman is with child, and obviously we believe that, um, you know, life begins at conception. And I mean, the woman with her seed, it's talking about her, her kind of, her, her, her descendants, those who are going to come out of her loins, um, from now on, as in um, people who are going to come from her lines from that point onwards, who are going to bring victory over Satan. And I mean, it's not just talking about one seed. As I've said countless times in the Bible, we see um, the seed of the woman, um, the child that's given birth, who grows up and be the, the deliverer um, of Israel or a nation from um, Satan or from um, the forces of evil, and I mean, his seed is talking about Satan's Satan's offspring, Satan's um, say the the people Satan um grows up uh whose whose job is to, to destroy, for example, the the Israelites or to destroy the people of God and so on and so forth. So this this is kind of a prophecy um that that kind of cascades. Throughout um, the Old Testament, all the way to the New Testament, so we get the actual seed of the woman, the the main seed, Jesus, and we get um, Satan himself, who is bruised by the seed of the woman, by Christ himself, by his death on the cross. So this is um, this has multiple um, cascading effects here. Yeah, I, I agree with everything you said. Uh, I have a couple of thoughts, but first let me ask Ronnie, do you want to uh, expand on or elaborate on what uh, Salam said? The seed between thy seed, which is Satan's seed, and her seed, which is she was married. Uh, mute, unmute. I thought I did. Is it okay now? Okay. I feel like a midget among giants here listening to you guys. I mean, God has just so blessed you with the Holy Spirit and the knowledge. I see also uh, the seed of the woman uh, being also Mary, but with a capital S. She, he, for Christ is born of a virgin. Uh, and, and we see that uh, was, that proves that there's no man involved, that this as the second Adam is the second creation where God created a perfect body. Uh, to begin with. The, only diff the big difference being is that Jesus never sinned, Adam did. But we can also look, like the brother is saying, uh, Brother Salam, I just I never heard that what he said before, and I thought that was fantastic. 
you look at the uh, bride of, of God, Israel, or, or the wife of God, Israel, and we see the Israelites, you know, um, and, and the fight, the Satan coming against the children of uh, the bride uh, of Israel, or a God as the wife of, of the Father. And we look in the New Testament, the New Testament church being the bride of Christ and fighting against Satan. Even though Jesus uh, did defeat Satan at the cross, you know, we have to hold a hold ground as is Ephesians 6 against the enemy, but the coming one, uh, he's going to... The Lord God is going to give him a double whammy, Satan, because the coming one, the Antichrist, who is to come, whom I believe is to come during the seven-year tribulation, uh, Christ is going to return and destroy him too then. Yeah. Yeah, he's going to uh, defeat Satan. Uh, he defeated him at the cross, and then he'll defeat him also in the future. But uh, uh, I, I don't uh, disagree with anything that uh, you guys have said on this. But I, I'm wondering, you alluded to it, uh, the virgin birth, but do uh, you think that this is a valid uh, text to refer to the virgin birth? When we, were, when we think of the seed of a woman, we think that's impossible. A woman doesn't have a seed. The man has the seed. So how, what possibly explains that? And we know that she was overshadowed by the Holy Spirit, conceived by the Holy Spirit, and that's why there was no man, no human man seed that impregnated her. So uh, I know I've seen this used uh, uh, by a lot of people to, uh, to indicate the virgin birth. Uh, the other thing I wanted to say is the, uh, I've heard a lot of people say, and I know that uh, I think Paul referred to uh, either Paul or Jesus or both, to people as a child of the devil. In other words, they, they say, if you're either a child of the devil, you're a child of God. Now, you and I, we, we're all a child of God. When we put our faith in Jesus Christ, we are born again as a child of God. Uh, but before that, uh, people could argue that we were children of the devil. And Jesus referred to some of the Pharisees as children of the devil. I, I don't think it, that condemnation was only because they were the self-righteous religious leaders, but also because people are uh, the seed of the serpent, the seed uh, that is referred to here. So Satan's seed is all of mankind that's fallen. He led to the fall. He instigated the fall of man. And so therefore, all fallen men, when we come out of our mother's womb, we are the seed of Satan, a child of the devil, until we get born again and become a child of God. Now, if you think I'm, you know, that's uh, not a valid point, uh, go ahead and let me know. You don't have to agree with me, but I know that I've seen this verse used to make those points. Okay, uh, all right, then let's go on. And by the way, you know, I, I've just said it, but, you know, so long you've been on the program several times now, and Ronnie, it's your first time, but. Uh, I don't want you to feel like you have to agree with me every time. We don't necessarily have to agree on everything. Uh, we agree on the deity of Christ. We agree that no work is required for salvation. It's simply faith yeah. in our Savior. We agree that we cannot never, we can never lose our salvation for any reason. And after that, I believe it's okay to disagree on things. Uh, and uh, so whether it's whether it's uh, kind of a, like a, a a doctrine or a, a, a theological subject, or if it's just little nuances, just the nuances of how we see little things, little differences, it's okay to disagree. Uh, let's move now to Genesis 4.1. It says, Cain uh, brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. And Abel, as he also brought of the firstlings of his flock, and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering, but unto Cain and to his offering he had not respect. Okay, who wants to talk about that? Uh, this, this, of course, is another great picture of the, um, of the struggle that will forever ensue 
ever since ever since Adam and Eve tried to um, you know cover up their own sins with their own works, uh, we see another picture here of their children um, doing the same in inadvertently. Maybe maybe Cain genuinely thought that um, that by giving his best he would gain favor with God. I mean I don't know, but we see here another marked difference between faith and works. I mean, giving your best efforts to God, as we see Cain is trying here, giving him the offering of the ground. I mean, his best efforts, he's worked hard, he's brought the best that the earth can give to God. And Abel, just by faith, um, just doing what God has told him to do, and to bring a sacrifice, a blood sacrifice. I mean, this, this is as clear as it gets faith us work faith to works faith to works I mean this has been from the beginning there's nothing new under the sun so this this is just another clear example of that yeah I, I think that this is a, a very uh, making exactly the same point that we discussed with the fig leaves versus the the, uh, the coat the shed the blood was shed for that coat uh, the fig leaves it was their own work they, they were trying to Solve the problem through their own effort, and in this case, we've also got the the work of Cain. Uh, and even though he gave the best, and maybe it was very sincere, um, I think we we've all spent time doing evangelism. We we witness to people, tell people about Jesus, and I, I don't know if you guys have ever used this technique, but uh, it's one of the best things I used. It. Uh, I, I took a course. Many years ago, right after I got saved by D. James Kennedy, it's called Evangelism Explosion. And in that course, he said there are these basic diagnostic questions. That you ask. Diagnostic means that you would diagnose your condition. You can determine, uh, as best we can anyway, at least if they're saved or not, based upon how they answer these questions. And he has two questions, but I, I reduced it just to one. But uh, he, he says, are you certain you're going to go to heaven when you die? And if they say, no, I'm not certain, I hope I will, well, you know there's a problem uh, there. But if they say, yeah, I'm certain, then you ask him, why? Uh, based on what? And, and how they answer these questions tells us what their faith is in. Is their faith in their own performance, their own ability, their own ability to provide the best to God as the best they had to God as uh, Cain did? Even though Cain was sincere, and even though the people we meet in our evangelism, they're sincere. They say, well, I'm doing the best I can. I, I, I follow the golden rule, and you know, I, I, I'm a pretty good person, and so on. But no matter how sincere we are, the best we can, the best we have, is like filthy rags in the sight of God. And we have to recognize that uh, we cannot provide some uh, uh, offering like uh, what, the, the fruit of the ground. We can't offer them the food of the ground. The only thing that satisfies God is the blood. Mm -hmm. and, and so we have to rely on the blood. Jesus' blood, a sacrifice for our sins. So, um, okay, Ronnie, did, did, you, did you comment on this verse yet? Cain and Abel? Unmute. 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 Can you hear me? Okay. My Bible must be different because uh, I'm sorry, guys, but uh, Ann says that Abel gave uh, of the first, or, or gave of, you know, um, what was that here? And unto, oh, wait a minute. Came to pass that Cain brought the fruit of the ground and offering of the Lord. And Abel, he also brought of the firstlings of the flock. And that thereof, and the Lord uh, had respect unto Abel in his offering. I, I don't think any of these two uh, young men were different uh, in that they're both human and and, and uh, men, but it's that uh, Abel brought the correct offering, as you guys are saying. But uh, and I, I agree that the works of the ground which is the works of the flesh, I, I, we could compare this to 
you know, will never bring us to the Lord, to God. It, it's the blood covering uh, back in the Old Testament, looking for the blood washing in the New Testament that I see as the flock here, I, I think points to Jesus as a lamb. Now, they could have said flock of geese, but I think we can refer to it as probably a flock of sheep and lambs. Thank you. Yeah, the, um, both of you made the point uh, trying to give uh, Cain some credit the saying that he thought he was sincere and he gave the best that he had and, and, it was, and he was the same as Abel. Their intentions were the same. Uh, their heart was in the same place. And I think that also goes with our evangelism. I mean, a lot of people, they have their heart in the right place and, and they're doing the best they can, but the problem is their faith is in the wrong thing. Their faith is in their own ability rather than trying to appease God through what they do instead of putting their faith in what God did for them that they're, to satisfy this problem. And, uh, so their, their object, the object of their faith is is was not in the blood atonement, which is the whole theme of this whole study. Now let's look at uh, Noah and the ark. Uh, and all I'm going to say, and I'm not going to cite any verses, so you guys can uh, cite verses if you like, but how does Noah, well, let's not, not talk about Noah for a moment, let's just talk about the ark itself. Uh, do you see anything represented in the ark and the flood and the escape uh, that would be an indication of uh, this uh, salvation? Uh, yeah. Yeah, the, the fact that, um, you know, the ark, the ark was built with only one door. And um, it was one door in the ark and only one door out. And um, that pictures how, you know, with in salvation there's only one door, and that's Christ. And here's the thing. Man could not open that door or close that door. It was God who shut them in. And it's interesting because, you know, even though the ark um, was caught up in, in the whole great worldwide flood, I'm sure the ark would have been beaten, would have been battered, and people in the ark and the animals would have fallen down and being thrown left to right, but they still would have been on that ark, showing how, for example, for us, when we're saved, hey, we can make mistakes, we can fall down, we can stumble, but we're still saved. I mean, there's, there's, no, there's, there's no getting off that ark. I mean, that's us, and we are done. And it doesn't matter if the storms of life beat us down, we're still going to be in that ark. Why? Because God was the one who shut us in. It wasn't us, it was God. And also as well, it says um, the ark was built with slime and pitch. And slime and pitch was made with a combination of mud and blood. And so the whole ark is covered in this slime and this pitch, which is made of blood. Showing how, for example, we're washed by the blood of Christ. We are covered by Jesus Christ's blood. And of course, there are, there are many other pictures, but these are just some uh, from the top of my head. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, Brother Ronnie, do you want to talk about the ark? Do you have anything to say about that, comparing it to our salvation? Well, uh, for our salvation, I also see the ark, yes, as Christ. We're in Christ as uh, Noah, his uh, three sons, Noah's wife, and uh, his son's wives taken into the ark. And I love that comment the brother made about the door. I never thought of that before. Nor did I know that about the blood and uh, being mixed in to make the pitch. Well, i got to tell you, brother, I look forward to the rapture <laughs> in this verse um, where Christ is going to, you know, being in Christ ourselves, have, being sealed in with the Holy Spirit of, of God of Christ, we will be taken up and out of here one day. And uh, you look at what God said about Noah. He said he was perfect in his generations, and a lot of nasty stuff was going on back then. If we look at Genesis 6, where uh, sons of God came on to women, and <coughs> many people believe that uh, there is a mixture there between the fallen and, and the children of men through the, through the wives of women, a trading of knowledge there. So 
we don't know. I, I'm not positive on those points, but I see. But to get back to the point, yes, I see. Uh, there's no rain prior to that. Uh, no uh, man of righteousness. I don't think it ever rained prior to that time either. So I'm sure everybody laughed at him just like they laugh at us nowadays when we try and tell people about Jesus, uh, the Ark, um, who will who save us from that that judgment that's, that that is to come. There was a judgment prior that destroyed the world, and there's going to be a great war during that time of uh, tribulation. At the end of it, where Jesus Christ and Satan meet in battle, and Jesus Christ will uh, destroy them and with the brightness of his coming. Oh, thank you, brothers. You're such a blessing to me. Okay. Um, I'm all, all, all of them, are, everything you said, brothers, are very good points. I don't disagree with anything, but I would say that I, I look at this Noah and the Ark as uh, Noah is a type of Savior, and, and the Ark is the type of uh, not only salvation, but the Holy Spirit. See, uh, Noah said anybody could come into that ark. It wasn't just for his family. It was open for anybody. One of my favorite words in the Bible is the word whosoever. Over and over again, I can show, tell you verses that say, whosoever calleth upon the name of the Lord. Whosoever means any person without exception. And that ark, and Noah's call, was whosoever wants to come into the ark to be saved. Whosoever. And then once they came in, and they sealed it, they were saved. They were saved. And it's like we answer the call of Jesus, come to me, and we get saved, and then we get sealed in that ark. We get sealed in the Holy Spirit until the day of redemption. Yep. So, yeah, these are beautiful pictures of our salvation. Um, I don't see blood in it, but I do think that Moses is a type of Christ, and the, and the, uh, the ark is a type of salvation. Uh, let's go now to, um, we're going to move on to like Abraham and Isaac. Uh, let's, I'm going to read Genesis starting uh, chapter 22, uh, 1 through 18. I'll read it all, and then we'll go back slowly through it. And it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham and said unto him, Abraham, and he said, Behold, here I am. And he said, Take now thy son, thine only son, Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will tell thee of. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it upon Isaac, his son. And he took the fire in his hand and the knife. And they went both of them together. And Isaac spake unto Abraham, his father, and said, My father, he said, Here I am, my son. And he said, Behold, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? And Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went, both of them, together. And they came to the place which God had told him of. And Abraham built an altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac, his son, and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched forth his hand, and took the knife to slay his son. And the angel of the Lord called unto him out of heaven, and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here I am. And he said, Lay not thine hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him. For now I know that thou fearest God, seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering in the, in the stead of his son. And 
In thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because thou hast obeyed my voice. There's a lot there. I want to, we're going to work our way through this slowly. Uh, but uh, first, let's just get an overview from each of you. And then I'm going to ask you about some key parts of this that I think are just very, very powerful. Uh, go ahead, Salam. Start off and tell me what you think of this whole story. Well, this is this is one of my favorite, um, not only one of my favorite stories in the Old Testament, but one of one of the clearest pictures of Jesus Christ. Not not only just Jesus Christ, but God the Father, His relationship with Christ, um, of course, the Son of God, as well. I mean, there, there's so many things we can talk about um, in these verses you've read, but I want to draw your attention to verse 5 of Genesis 23, when Abraham said unto his young men who had accompanied him and his son to uh, Moriah, and Abraham said unto his young men, Abide ye here with the ass, and I and the lad will go yonder, and worship and come again to you. So I mean Abraham was under no illusion that you know whatever he was going to do up in Mount Moriah if he had to sacrifice Isaac, hey he believed, he sincerely believed that God would raise him up again from the dead. I mean he his faith was so strong that he had no um, he had no qualms in saying to um, his servants, you know, we'll be back, you know, knowing fully well that he was going to sacrifice his son. And if you read Hebrews 11, 19, it, it sheds light on this. I mean, it, it sheds light on Abraham's faith in this area, knowing that Christ would raise him up again. I mean, God would raise his son up again from the dead, just like how Christ was raised up again from the dead. And so, I mean, there's so many other things we can talk about, but that's just one. I'm going to, I'm going to go through it slowly and, and challenge everybody on, on, on a lot of um, uh, little points as we go through it again. But again, just give me a, a, just a general overview. Uh, Brother Ronnie? Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Now, praise God, I see, you know, the Father well, first of all, Abraham obeying the father and bringing uh, his son, a type, the father and his son, God himself, who would someday bring Jesus to become a sacrifice for our sins. But here we look at Abraham and Isaac as a type. Uh, there is wood, picturing the cross. There is the, the binding to that wood as Jesus Christ was bound to that cross. There is the, uh, the, the, the idea of when Abraham would come down, that he would be pierced, that he would bleed, and that he would die. But I think a wonderful thing is uh, earlier it said that God, after all this, when God said, uh, had an angel say stop, that there, that God Himself would supply the lamb. Abraham said earlier, but there was a ram caught in a thicket. God supplied that too. But it was a picture, a perfect type of Christ to come. You know, the the, the death of the Son. Uh, you know, and like like my brother said about the future resurrection of him too. It's perfect typology, shadow foretelling of the cross, the Son of God dying, bond to wood. Uh, also, it would be, be a burning sacrifice, and there we can see the burning wrath of God coming down on, on, on Jesus on the cross for our sins. And that was a terrible payment our Lord went through for us. Um, yeah, that that's what I see, brother. Wow. You know, uh, I I think I was talking to you about this uh, yesterday, Ronnie. But uh, as I've gotten older, I've become more emotional. My my wife comes in, and oftentimes she'll see me weeping, and she'll tease me. <laughs> yeah. she, says, she says, "Next thing I know, you're going to have breasts. You're crying like a, a little girl." You know. <laughs> but when I read this, I can hardly contain myself because of the, the, the joy and also broken heart, what I know God had to do for our benefit and how much he loved us. It just, it just, it breaks my heart but gives me joy and it brings tears because of it. it's such a beautiful, 
I've often said that uh, the, the Bible is a love story. And uh, this, this scene here really shows us how much God loves us. And you, every point you've made is, is per perfect. Um, well, I want to say a couple of things, uh, and, and then we're going to go through it verse by verse. Uh, on one hand, you look at um, Abraham and his, the promise God made to him that he was going to have this son, and through his seed would be a great nation, and through that there would be a... Um, a, a promise of uh, the Messiah. I don't remember how it's phrased exactly as the promise, but uh, that we know that the Messiah would become through that family line. I mean, all the nations of the world would be blessed through this seed of Abraham. Uh, and so he, he, God, Abraham has this promise from God, and now God's telling him to kill his only son because we know that uh, um, um, Ishmael, is not the, son, the right son. So the only the only son that is ordained by God as the uh, seed the, is, is Isaac, not not Ish, uh, Ishmael. So Isaac, his, this is the only hope that Abraham has of God keeping his promise. And now he has God telling him to kill him. So as um, Balaam said, I I have to conclude that. Uh, it, um, Abraham didn't probably picture Isaac being killed and then and then God giving him another son later on. No, uh, he, he probably figured, I'll kill him. God's commanded me to give him a sacrifice. God will raise him from the dead or something, but I'm going to trust God, you know. So he trusted God, and that's that's Abraham's faith is the picture of uh, uh, the kind of faith that we're supposed to have, just faith in God, uh, and Paul talked about how Abraham was saved by his faith, not by, not by what he did, but what his faith was. Um, and then we've got, uh, verse by verse, I'm going to go through it. I'm going to pause and ask you certain things here. Um, it says, Take now thy son, thine only son, Isaac. Now, we know that he had another son, right? We had Ishmael. But yep, obviously yep. God didn't count Ishmael as the son. He was not the legitimate son that God planned. Uh, that was the work of Abraham and uh, Sarah uh, taking it upon themselves to, to solve the problem. Uh, and so God says he is his only son is Isaac. Now, only son, obviously, what do we think of when we hear only son? Of Jesus the only begotten Son of God. Now, the only begotten, now we are sons of God, but He's the only one begotten. We are grafted into the family. We are adopted. We're adopted. Yep. And uh, Jesus is begotten because He is God Himself manifest in the flesh. Yep. But now it says, not only thine only Son, but it says, whom thou lovest. Now, compare that to John 3.16. Yep. Yeah. Um, so we have these words here that are like, uh, they just, they flash and they're like alarms going off saying, Thine only Son, whom thou lovest. And it says at the baptism of Jesus, Jesus, this is my beloved Son whom, whom I love. Uh, listen to. And that was at the transfiguration. Listen to him. But I think at the baptism he also said, This is my beloved Son. Uh, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and it says, and offer him there. Offer him as a burnt offering. And so we know that we think Jesus, in the same way, is offered up as a sacrifice for our sins. Now, when it says that Abraham took the wood and the burnt offering and laid it upon Isaac, his son. Uh, Ronnie, you, you talked about that. I didn't think of the burnt offering as the wrath of God, as you pointed out, but I think it's a good point. It's, it's a very, very probably a valid point. Uh, but I, what stood out to me is the wood, and he's laid upon it. Laid upon the wood, just as Jesus was laid upon the cross. Then we go down here into verse 8. It says, 
God will provide himself a lamb. Now, I saw uh, uh, David Geisler, uh, he has a YouTube channel called Promise Grace, and he was doing an interesting teaching and um, he was he referred to this verse, but he used uh, he was using it in the NIV. Now, if you guys know me very well, I'm not a KJV only person. I was KJV only for many years, and then I moved away from it. And uh, even though I love the KJV and I try to look at it first, I still like to look at every translation, and it helps me understand things better. So I'm not. Uh, some people would criticize me for that, but I'm going to say here I pointed out to Dave. David Geisler, when he cited the NIV in this, it, it was phrased differently. And I said, if you look at the, the King James here, it says, God will provide himself a lamb. God will provide himself a lamb. To me, that is saying himself a lamb. He's going to provide himself as a lamb. Yes. Yeah. So then... And then let's go down to um, verse 9. It says, And laid him on the altar upon the wood. Again, it's symbolic of Jesus being laid on the wooden cross. Um, now, here's something that nobody mentioned, but to me it, it, it stands out like a sore thumb. Verse 13, And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him a ram caught in a thicket by his horns, caught in a thicket by his horns. Before I say it, does anybody going to tell me what this thicket caught by his horns symbolizes? Yeah, the crown of thorns on Jesus Christ's head. Yeah. The ram's head was caught in a thicket of thorns. Just as Jesus' head was caught in a thicket of thorns, that crown of thorns that they hammered onto his head. And it says, and offered him up for a burnt offering in the stead of his son. In the stead. And this is how Jesus was offered up. In our stead. In our place. Okay. Uh, all right. Uh, anybody want to say anything more about that, that before we move on to... Uh, Isaac and Ishmael. Um, I was going to say, um, it says that behold. Sorry, guys. Um, no. It says, but behold him, a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. Um, it's as you said, of course, it's the crown of thorns. But um, you know, um, I've completely lost my train of thought. I was going to say something from verse 13, but... You got, see this book, bro? This is what I got here. A little pen and paper. When a thought comes to my head, I just write it down there so I can don't, won't forget it. You know what? I use, oh, yeah. I have my, my highlight pen and Bible, so I usually just highlight and I take notes, but for some reason, I did not take notes on that verse, so... When, yeah, when I mean, you, amen, you know, brother. Everything you said was just perfect. The ram court is the, the crown of thorns on uh, picturing on Jesus' head. I was going to say another point referring back to um, the book of Genesis. Remember it says um, that um, God, God told Adam, curse, now let me just read out the verse for you so I don't miss it. It says there, uh, it says uh, in Genesis chapter 3 verse 17, and unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and thou hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it, cursed is the ground for thy sake, in sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. And verse 18, Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. So God told Adam, Out of the ground are going to grow thorns, thorns, right, and it's going to be for your sake. Why is it going to be your sake? Because these very same thorns which curse the ground are going to be the thorns which are going to crown our Savior's head. Now the ram was caught in the thicket by his horns. 
Why? Because of the curse of the because the cursed ground here in Genesis chapter three. So all of this is for our sake. The cursed ground, it's going to bring up thorns. The ram caught in the thicket, why? Because there were thorns there. Christ, the thorns in his head. So that was what I was going to say. So it came yeah, back yeah. to me. Yeah, good point. It will usually come back to you. Uh, you know, I know you're a young man. Uh, I'm the one that's supposed to have the forgetful thoughts here. I'm the, I'm yeah, the oldest. Yeah, it's, it's like 11.40 now, so it's... I know. Uh, I gotta, it gets a, time. I, I gotta always remember that and give you more grace because it's late hour in London, England right now. <laughs> Thank you, brother. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, he was caught in the thicket of thorns, just as man is caught in the thicket of our sins. And, yep. uh, uh, brother Ronnie, you mentioned something that no, none of us or I had other. We had mentioned about the the. The dagger, the, the knife being used as piercing, piercing Jesus. And uh, I hadn't thought of that either, but that was, I think, a very good point. What's your concluding remarks on this, uh, Ryan? Then we'll move on. Now, uh, I just see that from Goshen here to Moriah, then later to Sinai, you know, the law, and then back again to Moriah, you know, where the Temple Mount was and where Jesus had to die outside the city gates. but. It's just so beautiful, so many types and types of typologies that are given here, just so far, you know, of our Lord. It's, it floors me, and, and, and to hear the giftings of the Holy Spirit out of you guys and, and learning so much more, just maybe word for, for, or word out of each of these sentences is just glorious, and I praise and thank God for it. Yeah. Hey, uh, and you know, there's, there's a lot, a lot more that can be said that we are not thinking of. Uh, as I studied this this week, trying to prepare for this, uh, you got to mute it again, Ronnie. Um, as I, did, I actually did more preparation this week than I normally do because most of my other teaching is all about salvation, about the New Testament, and that is something I, I kind of know like the back of my hand. I don't really need to study for it. So this week I had to put a lot of time studying. As I did, I saw... Uh, there's even so much more that, that we, we're leaving out a lot of interesting things too, like the location, where the location was of this, and it later became the location in, uh, uh, it was Jerusalem or, I don't remember. Uh, let's move on to um, now Galatians 4.21 through 31. Tell me, ye that desire to be under the law, do ye not hear the law? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondmaid, the other by a free woman. But he who was of the bondwoman was born after the flesh, but he of the free woman was by promise. Which things are an allegory? For these are the two covenants, the one from the Mount Sinai, which gendereth to bondage, which is Agar. For this Agar is Mount Sinai in Arabia, and answereth to Jerusalem, which now is and is in bondage with her children. But Jerusalem, which is above, is free, which is the mother of us all. For it is written, Rejoice, thou barren that bearest not, break forth and cry, thou that travailest not, for the desolate hath many more children than she which hath a husband. Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are the children of promise. But as then, uh, he that was born after the flesh persecuted him that was born after the spirit, even so it is now. Nevertheless, what saith the scripture? Cast out the bondwoman and her son, for the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. So then, brethren, we are not children of the bondwoman, but of the free. 
All right. Uh, I've got a few things in mind to discuss, but uh, first let me ask you just generally comment on this situation here uh, that is uh, discussing um, Isaac, uh, uh, Isaac versus Ishmael and uh, Hagar versus uh, Sarah. Um, you know, this this goes back to the to the whole topic of this entire um, web study, um, types and shadows um, from the Old Testament. You see here in the book of Galatians, we're, we're given an allegory. Of course, um, Hagar, 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 of course, and Sarah were both real people. So was Abraham. So was Mount Sinai, and so on. And um, and Jerusalem, of course, all these things are real, all these things are actual, but the picture they show, you know, is for us today, it shows a the difference between those who are born of the promise of those who are born by the flesh, faith and works. Yet again, back to the same topic, it's like a broken record. The faith, those, those who are born by faith are those who believe God and take Him at His word, Abraham, I will give you a son. Take me at my word. Believe it by faith. Abraham had a lapse in faith. So did Sarah, of course. And they gave in to their flesh. Hagar was born. No, Hagar. Ishmael was born. I'm tired. Ishmael was born through Hagar. So now we have two sons. One of the bondwoman, one of the free. Faith and works. I mean, it's the same thing over and over again. I mean, it, it just shows this allegory, this whole story shows us how we, those who are um, saved by faith, are just children of the promise, child, a child of the promise of Isaac. And those who are by works are the children of the bond maid, Agar. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, Ronnie, what do you want to say about this section? Just that I see, like the, um, the brother said, um, there's one who's born a, a, under the slave woman, which it, or well, and the other was born under the promise. Now I see the slave woman Hagar as being Israel uh, in the law, and uh, that's what pretty much what Paul is battling against back then. You see the freedom of the free woman uh, Sarah, who had the son with Abraham. Uh, Isaac, from whom the promise would come of, of the Christ, um, you know, they had even, even though Sarah made a mistake by uh, going and having Abraham have a child with with a slave woman, and you see that those who are under the law, those who are born under a slave woman, they are slaves, and, and rejected also. I see, because God had told uh, Abraham to push uh, Isaac or. Uh, Ishmael out of the camp, that God hated Ishmael, which I believe truly means that God hated the symbolism of that and, and how it came to be. It's like uh, in, in the imperfection of the law to save uh, that the uh, free woman would, would uh, believe in, by grace uh, to faith in, in Jesus Christ, who, who is the true child of uh, Oh, we are we are the children of the free woman who believe in Christ. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, all true, and there's one word in this whole thing that really stands out to me that fits with the whole concept of the study, and that is that the Old Testament is the New Testament concealed. The New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. And that is when Paul uses this, these uh, scriptures here, and he calls it allegory. So we have Jesus on a couple of occasions saying, look at the old, the, all the scriptures, that tells you about me. Paul went to synagogues over and over again, went through the scriptures saying, this is fulfilled through Jesus. And Paul is now saying, here that this is an allegory. The point we're making is the Old Testament. These are all allegories, pictures, shadows, of types of Christ and the blood atonement. Um, but the key to here is that you know Paul 
I made a video titled uh, Comparing Apostles John and Paul. And uh, I've met people, it's uh, been a really big surprise on YouTube over the years. Uh, I've met some people that uh, hate the Apostle Paul. They say he's a false apostle. You know, in, in the scriptures, uh, Paul was defending himself, saying that some of you think I'm a false apostle. He was defending that he was a real apostle. So the charge against Apostle Paul uh, is not modern. I mean, it goes back to the beginning of the church, where he was challenged on that. And then other people take the other point of view that Paul's not a false apostle. In fact, he's the only apostle. We, we shouldn't even listen to John or anybody else, only Paul. That's, that's a crazy extreme, I think, too. Uh, but then I've also had people who take that position. Um, they argue against John and saying, uh, Salam, you, you don't read the Gospel of John as a Christian. You can't read that. That's not to us. That's just to the Jews. So I made a video saying, comparing apostles John and Paul, and I said both of them are teaching what I call easy believism. Uh, John says 99 times in his book, believe, 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 believe. Over and over again, he's, all he's requiring, the only thing required is believe, believe. And um, the Apostle Paul says the same thing, except now he has these false teachers coming into the early church wanting to add Judaism back in and mix them together. And, and Paul, so he's saying, believe, believe, believe. Hey, stop trying to add Judaism. It's only believe. It's faith alone. It's faith alone. Faith alone. So Paul had to take a step up and, and, and like put believe on steroids and say, it's not just believe. It's saying, don't mix the old religion with this anymore. Judaism, all the sacrifices, all of the, the, the religious of the, the past, that has to be separated. And it says here, cast out the bond woman and her son. Cast it out. We can't have any of this bond woman mixed with the free woman. Um, all right, I'm going to move on to a, another a point. Wait, wait a second. It's not a verse. I'll just read this here. Uh, Jacob versus Esau. And then I'm, after this, we better close because I've got to finish this within the two-hour time limit. Uh, God used Esau as a type of Israel in the Old Covenant, while Jacob is a type whose antitype is the New Covenant Church. Israel came first and was by rights the firstborn child of God. Yet God, in his sovereign will, chose to take the right of the firstborn son and give it to the Gentiles. So the, the, the point of this is that when we look at Jacob and Esau, who was firstborn? Esau. Uh, pardon, sir? He was firstborn? Esau was firstborn. Yeah, Esau was firstborn, of course. According to Judaism, the firstborn uh, has all the rights and privileges and the, uh, the, the, the primary biggest portion of the inheritance and so on, the blessings. Everything goes to the firstborn. And yet, God declared that even though Esau was the firstborn, no, he was going to give the blessing and the, the status to the secondborn. Yeah. And this is the picture here of the Jews first being the, the uh, as you call them, the bride of Christ, the, the, uh, the, the promise came to the Jews first, and then he said, okay, you, you've turned it down, now we're going to give favoritism to the Gentiles, and uh, the, the, the church rather than the Jews. So can you see a comparison between Jacob and Esau and uh, Judaism and uh, Christianity? Yep. All right. Um, we can maybe elaborate on that a little bit further next time. Uh, I want to see, I opened up this uh, thing uh, four hours ago. In, in about three minutes, it will be four hours. And I believe the limitation on one of these hangouts is four hours. I opened it two hours early because I've had a lot of problems uh, with the previous ones where I open it up and there's some technical difficulty and I've got to scramble around trying to make it all work. And, but now I've pretty much got it down so I don't have any problems.
But uh, I wanted to allow two hours because I don't want to have to be up past uh, any more past Salam bedtime. It's going to be midnight soon in London. So uh, we've got a lot. We've only basically uh, uh, scratched the surface on this study here. And uh, we'll, we'll, we'll probably need at least two or three more of these sessions. I hope that um, both of you will uh, be available. We had a couple other people who wanted to join us, but they have other problems, either situation in their life tonight or a problem with computers again. But uh, I'm really happy, Ronnie, that you were able to work it out and, and join us. And Salam, thank you for being faithful and continuing with me in these studies. Um, I want to. I'm going to say good night in a minute, but I want to give you guys a chance to, to say any closing comments on what we've discussed so far, uh, and, and then we'll say good night to everybody. Uh, so, Salam, how about you first? Um, yeah, I'm just I've just been blessed to be part of this. Um, every single one I've been part of, I've just learned so much, and I hope um, what I've said has been a blessing to any who's been listening. And um, you know, it's good to be a like-minded believers. Amen. Amen. Now, Brother Ronnie, do you got anything closing remarks to say to uh, Salam and me and the world? Sure. Uh, <laughs> I guess I was a little nervous this first time around. Um, my thoughts didn't come together as well as I had hoped. You know, brother, like I said, I could probably write them down better. So next time I'm going to cheat and I'm going to call you <laughs> and I'm going to ask you, what, what scriptures are you going to go through, brother? And then I'll... I'll think and I'll pray and if God will give me something to write down and I'll be ready the next time. But you guys are such a blessing and I, I kind of missed seeing those other two ladies who were on last time. Yeah. Oh, well, they're as anointed as, or, as you guys and just such a blessing. I just hope in some small way uh, I bless somebody too, you know. It Praise is, God. Uh, it's all the Holy <laughs> Spirit and work of God anyway. So. It did. Yeah, this is the first time I've been to church in 10 years. <laughs> Yeah. Let me. Uh, I'm, what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to say goodbye to the audience, and then keep you guys on, and we'll have a private conversation for a couple of minutes. And everybody who's watching, thank you for watching. Uh, if if you if you're not a, a Christian, it's easy. Just put your faith completely in Christ. Believe Jesus is the giver of eternal life. Believe He keeps His promise. He'll give you eternal life as a free gift. If you put your complete faith in him, he died for our sins, he rose from the dead, he's God incarnate, he has the power over life and death. Put your faith completely in our Savior, Jesus Christ, right now, please. Amen. Okay, thank you all for watching, and I'm going to end the broadcast, and I'll talk to you guys for a few minutes after this, okay?